Hey everyone, this is Luke and welcome to Exploring Kodawari. Our mission for this episode was to try and capture the beauty and art of the short story. It's a form of writing that I've always particularly loved. And to help us with this mission, we had on our good friend and writing professor, Joe Labriola. You might recognize him from being on a few of our previous episodes. He helped us think through what makes certain writers so great, and we even analyzed a piece of flash fiction by him called Coloring In. For now, instead of clumsily going on about why I love short stories, I do plenty of that in the episode, I'll read a short quote by William Boyd from his article, A Short History of the Short Story. I link this in the episode notes too, by the way. He says, The well-told story seems to answer something very deep in our nature as if, for the duration of its telling, something special has been created, some essence of our experience extrapolated, some temporary sense has been made of our common, turbulent journey towards the grave and oblivion. It sounds intense or exaggerated, but I think when you read certain short stories, you'll get what it means. And if you're not a big fan of short stories, don't worry, because in this episode we read two really short pieces, they're both less than 400 words, and we analyze what makes them work. Besides Joe's story, we also read the story Styx by the famous fiction writer George Saunders. That story is linked in the episode notes, only 392 words, but it might be one of the the best things I've ever read. There's just something about a well-written story like that that speaks to me so well. When I read certain sentences, I find myself making a kind of mm, sound at the sadness and truth that the story gestures at, this one in particular. Anyways, this episode was a bit of an experiment, so I hope it at least convinces you to check out the short stories we talked about here. I've also linked some other of my favorite, you know, short stories, some of them a bit longer, takes like 10, 20, 30 minutes to read, and those are all linked in the episode notes as well. And don't forget, if you like what we're doing here, please consider leaving a rating and a review in your podcasting app. Or if you really want to help us keep this going, please consider clicking through to our website to make a small donation. It takes time and money to keep a podcast like this going, and we will super appreciate any and all support that you can manage to give. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for being here, and enjoy the episode. It's ready as all. Too late, it's gone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but you can edit. No, I don't edit anything. Do you really not edit? I do sometimes. You should edit this. (laughs) This is the worst dead air I've ever heard. All right, Professor... (laughs) Joe Labriola. I prefer Professor. Professor. Thank you. Or in Turkish, Professor. Professor. Um, you've set a record. This is your third time on our podcast. No, it's not. Yeah. Is it? No, it's not. Is it second? Oh, it is the third time, yeah. Oh, but Game of Thrones. Game yeah, of Thrones, that's, that's right. That's exactly. True. Well, welcome. Yeah. So I wanted to do one on an episode on the art of the short story, and I can't handle that by myself, so here you are. I've heard of those, yeah. Um, and as tends to happen when I think of a topic that is in the back of my mind to do for a podcast, I find that like as I'm throughout the week like thinking about it, I'm also hearing a bunch of random things that correlate to it. Yeah, you you kind of have your your filter on for that yeah. subject, right? Yeah. You could say it's it's a synchronicity, but probably it's just my I'm I'm attuned to that. Yeah. Could be a little bit of both, but maybe it's probably at least the attunation. Probably probably as, more like when as you we buy say, a new car, you notice it everywhere type of phenomena. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. I notice green cars all of a sudden. <laughs> exactly. It's not yeah. because there's... Same, I, I notice green Chevys or whatever you have. Yeah, uh, Chevy Equinox. <laughs> yeah, I notice those all the time. And uh, when Yanka had a, a a cube, I was like, people actually <laughs> buy these cubes, apparently. Like, yeah. Where uh, were they before? Yeah, they were still there. Yeah. So I was listening to a, a podcast and they were talking about sort of the the importance of, of faith and reason and balance and all this stuff. And um, have you heard of the uh, John Updike, the the fiction writer? Yeah, I have not read enough John Updike, but, um, you know, from all accounts, great guy. And <laughs> <laughs> that's what you say when you haven't read an author. From oh, all yeah. accounts. Yeah. From all accounts. Which accounts guy. were those? Yeah, that's right. I've actually read a fair amount about John Updike, like uh, David Foster Wallace, I think, uh, has written about him and uh, like literary critics, yeah. those sorts of people, yeah. Um, so I've, I've, I don't know if this is like from an interview or something, or it's just like a, one of those stories that just makes its way through the writer's world of whatever. But, um, apparently John, uh, uh, it, the idea that, that it, great fiction is a, a form of truth telling. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he, somebody asked him like, um, why is it that you write about fiction? Why don't you write about the truth, something deeper? And he said, my good man, what makes you think I'm not writing about the truth? Yeah. And one of the stories we'll read today, I think, has so much truth in it without ever having to literally say it. 
and those are the best stories i think and i mean from my experience that sort of ties into just a core concept that's worth establishing right up front which you've probably even maybe heard of if you've had even one writing class before where they tell you to show your reader don't tell them details mm. and it's a good universal truth in general and actually it's funny that comes up as well because i was uh tutoring at the writing center where i tutor last week and i most of the students they're working on academic essays but once in a while you get a student doing creative writing and she had a short story that she wanted to work on and that was the baseline sort of point that we had to establish. Okay, you're doing a good job telling your reader all these details, but think how boring that is relative to if you show them those details. You mm -hmm. describe them in a way where the details you're choosing are trying to illuminate a greater truth. Uh, obviously, you know, starting out identifying important elements that foster a certain tone, for example, right? Or a certain mood of the yeah. piece, right? Like the one we'll we'll read in a bit sticks. It just it almost reminds me of Vonnegut in the way mm. a certain mood of like um, zoomed out truth telling. It's yeah. not zoomed in. Like sometimes parents are like this. Yeah, it's just kind of like this. Like it says everything in so little. Kind well, of vibe and and that's actually something that's really interesting to discuss because you don't see it discussed. Well, at least not, I guess, historically as much because it's a relatively new genre, whatever that means. You mean which, the short story? Well, flash fiction. Yeah. Which yeah. essentially, I, I think the story you're referring to, The Sticks by George Saunders, right? Yeah. Um, is a classic example of flash fiction, which is different than a short story. For what me. is the distinction there? Well, well, so a short... Is it just the length, pretty much? So, so many of these distinctions, and in fact, anybody who's listening who's tried to publish anything knows this, that these categories of short short story, um, flash fiction, novel, novella, they are generated by the virtue of what people decide they are. They are emergent phenomena yeah. within those fields. So uh, the definition of flash fiction is somewhat relative to the genre, to what publishers or agents decide that it is. There are sort of a relatively agreed upon guidelines, like after a certain length, you'll say, no, this is a short story. Sure. Uh, so, but that where that line exactly is, is, is sort of uh, vague and tenuous and it changes. But the general rule uh, from my perspective is that flash fiction more so captures a moment um, or a very specific set of moments. Mm -hmm. Whereas a short story, you have more will develop a lot more, yeah more yeah. flexibility in terms of transitions of places and times and character development uh, uh flash fiction it and it's by virtue of it's an, an interesting sort of uh assessment of the space that you're working with in terms of word length right where yeah you only have a certain amount of words to capture a certain truth right yeah. so you can't be going all over the map necessarily whereas a short story and then a novella which is longer and then a novel which is much longer you have those different avenues that you can explore and they all have their relative uh, merits and they're interesting. But I, I was really excited that you wanted to talk about short story because I think now more than ever and, and continually it's going to become more and more relevant. And I think it's, you know, more so what readers kind of look for with our shorter attention spans, which sounds yes. like it could be <laughs> a bad thing, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It's also the idea of constraining yourself as a writer, mm. right? Which is a good practice to yeah. teach yourself specific word choice and phrasing and details. Yeah. And mm -hmm. flash fiction, you have to do that. The The margin for error in saying, well, I didn't know what to say, so I used the word it or thing. You can use, in fact, some of the greatest writers ever, most of the greatest writers ever do use those vague words, but they're not using them because they don't know what else to say. Well, when Vonnegut says, mm -hmm. a big and difference. so it goes. Right. If it's not lame, <laughs> right? Exactly. And you could write an essay as a as a noob or a short story as a noob, and say that. And because it doesn't have the context, it's not really targeted for a specific point or purpose. That reads as just what what's going on. It doesn't have that impact. Mm -hmm. It could come across as absolutely pretentious. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Another John Updike quote I found was: "A writer of fiction, a professional liar." is paradoxically paradoxically obsessed with what is true. Yeah. And and I think um I don't know if you, you, would you say you you've written more in the world of poetry or short stories or fiction or like you you haven't really written a lot of nonfiction well, right, from articles. Yeah, that's there, right? that's a really good question. Um 
be, if, for the reason of the fact that I feel like this is probably true for most writers is that they're their sort of progression in their fields of what they write very much is a journey. So I, when I went to grad school for my master's in fine arts, creative writing, um, basically like the equivalent, I suppose, to a performance degree in music. You're, yeah. you're not so much studying English literature as the history of it. You're studying the craft of how to produce yeah. it yourself, right? How to be more successful at, at your, your craft. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's PhD. It's like the Hogwarts of writing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of witchcraft. Well, because I feel like there's no, no, magic behind good writing. No, that you're right. I, yeah. I don't. Yeah, I I can feel it when I see it or read it, whatever. Yeah. But I I if the idea of like looking yeah. at a cursor blinking on the screen and being like, all right, Luke, write a good yeah. uh, short story, fiction short yeah. story. I'm like, yeah, uh, and I'm sure I could do it if I just forced myself. But sure, I'm sure it wouldn't be but good the, too. But there's so well, there's <laughs> and what you're referring to is exactly what I learned in grad school. Because when I applied to grad school, I actually applied as uh, basically uh, my school in particular didn't have like set tracks necessarily. You did have to wind up um, essentially public uh, creating a public a publishable work in a genre like short fiction or novel mm -hmm. or poetry. So I went in focusing on poetry because I was really interested in poetry but through taking poetry classes fiction classes nonfiction classes I wound up actually transitioning into short fiction short story mm -hmm. and I think that was a really good thing that I went in uh, with poetry in mind because I feel like the poetry classes that I took and how and even the nonfiction classes I took and how those different sort of lenses to look at writing and like you said to explore truth really informed me of how to do that in the fiction genre so in terms of stuff that i've published since graduation yeah i've published short fiction but i still sort of publish what sort of feels natural manifests naturally i shared a story with you uh, a, a month or two ago the beach class the beach class yeah. story which what genre is that like what genre do, i would, would say that was that? flash fiction right? okay so it can read like flash fiction right it's actually it was published as narrative nonfiction. Hmm. Because it was based on my experiences beach cleaning and my reflection uh, or beach glass collecting rather and my sort of reflections on like what that means, like what deeper truth that speaks to. Um, now, if I just inserted a character like a hard protagonist with a different name and sort of rewrote the the style and the form, they, they all wouldn't. The yeah. They would be like, this is a narrative nonfiction. It's a flat, it's a short story. It's yeah. a flash fiction short story. So it's really funny how some of those technical details it's like, yeah, they, they sort of dictate what form it might be published under, but the underlying truth is is still the same, maybe. Yeah. And it's about how you feel. And in that case, I was like, this isn't a short story. This is like a weird... So it reads very poetically, too, right? Yeah, You yeah. would say like... It, it, like a poem that is structured as a story yeah. instead of a poem. Yeah. And that's, that's a very just sort of unique piece, but I think it's an effective piece for that reason because I wasn't thinking, oh, how do I contrive this into a short fiction story? I'm like, no, this specific idea and how I want to express it based on my experiences, I can do that in other ways through short stories. And one of the ones I think we're going to read in a little bit of mine um, does that, I think, but you can see how it does it in a much different way. Gotcha. Yeah. It's not unlike the... The drink we're all having. We're having an old fashioned right now. This is really good. This might be, I don't know if it's the whiskey you chose, but this might be the best it one. It could be. We were just I've, chatting I've before and I was putting the dashes of bitter. And I'm like, <laughs> is I on 12 or 13? So I went for one more dash of yeah. bitters, maybe. But it tastes really well balanced, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, like we have three of us here. So I made four old fashions and split it between our three glasses. Is that what's So we're each having 1.333333 old fashions. <laughs> Repeating forever. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. <laughs> that's why it's so good. Well, you know, the definition of any cocktail or any coffee drink, right? What's a latte versus a cappuccino? What's an old-fashioned? Yeah. There's a point. If I put gin in this instead of whiskey, I'd be hard-pressed to say I'm making an old-fashioned, right? Mm. But in the book I have of cocktail recipes, like there's – you'd be – it's insane how far out they they can go and still call it an old fashioned or something. Well, aren't you describing what we were just talking about with writing? That's what that's why I brought it up. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I'm it's, saying like the the categories yeah. do exist. It's not no information. Yeah, they tell you it's something. It's not nothing. But the boundaries right. are quite fuzzy. Yeah, and I think they should be. I and think overlapping. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of it. It's also the challenge of it as an art form worth pursuing. Right. Yeah. Where how do you you know, how do you sort of make those those decisions and, and those cutoffs? And I think that's the difference between, uh, you know, not good writers. And I, I kind of break it up as like there's like not good writers, there's good writers, and then there's the great writers. Yeah, that's essentially how I consider myself a good writer. 
um, because I put in the time and effort. I don't necessarily, I mean, I, I certainly have some intuition and talent because I have spent so much time working on it, but I mean, you read uh, like some of the writers that we love, they're just, I, I read it and I, I don't like it cause I'm jealous of it, <laughs> of how, <laughs> right. how when next level it is. Like how did they <laughs> find that? And, and they sentence, just sentence or how do they, they find whatever? Yeah, they just can't. But it's it's also inspiring in that sense, because you know that this is possible to do as well. But you're like, damn, I wish I got that idea first. <laughs> I know right. that feeling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was reading this article. I'll link it in the description. It's called the Sh- a short history of the short story by a guy named William Boyd. I don't know if if he's oh, a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had, I had I had I did shots with him the other night at yeah. the bar. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? He was here. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was in town. He. Uh, yeah, I was going to call you, but uh, we, so we, he was we quoting down. Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, who said of the short story, "Weird guy." Great writer, it has though. to be a narrative that quote can be read in one sitting, and that's true of twenty pages, and it's certainly true of the. You said quote can be read in. Oh, like you I was sl- th- it, like Poe's quote. It's a narrative that quote can oh, be okay. read in one set uh, sitting. Oh, okay. And then Poe also continued and said, in the whole composition, there should be no word written of which the tendency, direct or indirect, is not to the one pre-established design. And by such means, with such care and skill, a picture is at length painted, which leaves in the mind of him who contemplates it with a kindred art, a sense of the fullest satisfaction. Yep. Like the, the the short stories that I love, they're Every so word complete. He chose there was doing that. Even well. in that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. E- even in that, I'm like, I get what he meant, yeah. and and in not in just like a beep boop boop up information conveyed kind of way, but in like a I felt what he meant too. Yeah, like I felt what he was gesturing at was the same feeling I get at the end of this short story sticks. And and you you realize it very quickly reading. I uh, a friend gave me a book the other day, and she was saying. Oh, it's such a great book. It's it's so interesting. It moved me to tears. And I said, "Cool, I'll take a look at it." And one of the things I do now is I just flip to a random page and read the a random interesting, page. Interesting, interesting. And I did that, and within two sentences, I just saw several redundancies in terms of. I, I mean, I see this. As, so, for example, I don't remember specifically with that book, but I remember thinking like, I don't, "I'm not going to be able to read this because I grade so much and I write so much." When I see those redundancies, and what I mean are just kind of like repetitive words or words that unnecessary are right? unnecessary i can't it i stumble on them and i can't it really it's a struggle to work through and perfect example was i was grading cover letters and resumes for my students last week and the one phrase you see in most of them is i am currently a student at you know whatever university and i always say why are you saying you're currently a student? You are a student. And by virtue of being a student, you are currently there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's them trying to sound fancy. It's them trying to say, I am currently a student at yeah. this university of higher learning. <laughs> and But to me as a reader, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, that's an extra word. And it's indicative of all the other words that I'm going to find in there and phrases mm-hmm. that are just you trying to get to a full page because a full page looks nice. Yeah. And now I can't get that on my head and I'm a crazy person. And there's <laughs> also bothering me. I, I feel like people are almost taught like in this very postmodern academic world of like make it sound fancy and it's better. It's like that's not probably true. Like it can. I don't know. What do you prefer to read? Like a concise sentence like that Edgar Allan Poe quote? Or like like a, a jargony filled paper. Oh, this is a problem in, in teaching. So I teach writing as well, obviously. And it's a huge problem because so many times, and I tell my students this pretty explicitly, that the page counts are really suggestions. But I say in order to do the work of what the assignment prompt is, you're not going to be able to accomplish it if you don't make that page range. Mm-hmm. And if you go beyond that page range, you might have all that filler that you don't actually yeah. need. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a really an ongoing issue. And I say, I'd rather you have five really great pages where every word is specifically chosen and it's mm-hmm. meaningful and every phrase as opposed to eight pages and I'm, I can barely get through it because of mm-hmm. the jargon, like you say. Yeah. Or the boringness or boringness. Boringness, yes. I will, is that a word? I will accept it. Okay. That's, that's how bad the problem is. We need more words to describe okay. how annoying it is, yeah. Bianca, I wonder if there's any Turkish like short story tradition that you're aware of or have read or anything? I mean, at some point, I think I did, but I, I know you have a lot of poetry. 
Yeah. That I can't you. understand for shit because... Oh, it's beautiful. It's one thing yeah. to know a language like, hello, waiter, can I have a coffee? <laughs> yeah. Another thing to be like, on the hills of Doth, you know... Can, like, can I ask a, yeah. a rather strange question, at least from my crazy brain as it's sure. thinking it now? So you guys are obviously musicians and pretty talented musicians um, from my experience with artists in general, right? <laughs> um, but I'm curious in terms of writing music and reading music and performing music like do you ever see i guess amateur composers or just composers and i don't know what the proper terminology is but like somebody writes a piece or you read a piece and you're sort of feeling the same way like there's redundant notes or oh, there's god. like oh god yeah yes okay so um, i want to hear more about you can that smell it right away <laughs> yeah yeah and like some of them i think comes with age like it there are certain like really famous composers that like the more I age, the more I realize, oh, like this is just. Oh, the more you, you age. I age, okay. I think. Like I have a different kind of perception of like things, I think. Like remember we were talking about Bruckner the other day? Yeah. How like he had a lot of like good ideas and then he just throws all these ideas. But like there's no like connection or anything. It's just like, oh, nice melody. Oh, another nice melody. So is he a relatively famous composer? He is. He but is. he gets criticized okay. as being like long and drawn out and like get to the point, dude. Kind yeah. Of thing. yeah. And that's so interesting to hear because I have an alternate reality perception of myself where I am a musician or a composer. I think I would have made a fantastic composer mm -hmm. if I had been like trained from a very young age and my parents were yeah. crazy and they're like, mm -hmm. that's what you're doing. Piano lessons. Because I, I hear it in my yeah. head. Like I, I'll... You do I'll, have good pitch because I've tested yeah. you before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might even have perfect pitch and you just need like an hour No, of seriously. Like mm -hmm. I'll yeah. be in the shower and I'll think of like... Uh, compositions musical pieces where oh yeah the violins would do that or i'll even hear music and i'll think why aren't they doing this instead based on that progression cool. i don't have the lexicon i don't have the language to really express it mm -hmm. but yeah. i i do hear it you have the intuition yeah that's what mm -hmm. i mean it's it's sort of just this expressive intuition i feel like and that's why learning the tools are so important and, and it's difficult if you don't learn the tools early to learn them late it's the idea of you can't teach an, an old dog uh, new tricks right? right but it's it's so fascinating to hear that like you say about a composer where yeah. you listen and it's the same thing i i read very sort of uh like i said that that book my friend gave me famous authors well received authors but there's also criticism of those authors for the same reason where you're like yeah What's going on here, buddy? And then before I even like was aware of the criticism, like something about me was started being like, hmm, like. Mm. And I remember you told me like, I, not that I even researched, like, but it was like a widespread idea that I came to the. Conclusion. I don't know how widespread it is. I just remember um, a theory teacher in, in I, I guess it was undergrad or something. Mm -hmm. said the phrase quote Bruckner is garbage <laughs> I mean I wouldn't go that far probably I think that's taking it too far but that's a, a very a composer but that's, like opinion like but he's he like a pop singer you know what I mean just like you come up with the best melody and then you keep bringing it back in pop as music. a brass player I could never say that just because he writes really fun and intense brass parts but as a composer who's looking at the structure of a piece um it, it just, it like, it's basically the opposite of analyzing Bach or Mozart where you're like, this guy is like, yeah. this is like if the universe math could make sound, like, well, and, you know, the that, source code of the universe could make sound. I hear what but. you're saying too, because, that, and that's sort of what I was saying earlier, how when I hear a, a Beethoven or Sibelius piece, I never think to myself as I'm listening, oh, they should have done this also with yeah. the cellos mm -hmm. or the violins, but there's other classical music that I listen to mm -hmm. and I'm like... Or even I, I listen to a lot of like contemporary video game music. I think mm -hmm. it's a really cool genre because so much of it is orchestral and it's it's telling stories. It's used to help tell the stories. And some of it is just killing. It's so good. And mm -hmm. others I'm like, oh, you could have done so much more. <laughs> yeah. I know but, what but what you said about the, the quote where that guy said um, that Brockner is garbage. It mm -hmm. reminds me of a Kurt Vonnegut quote, which I think I've told you before, but it's worth reiterating along this line of like, what is the core essence? And it's a, a great story of how, so Vonnegut for anybody who doesn't know is a, I mean, I consider him top American science fiction writers of all time. Yeah. Like he's up there with Asimov, Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, Frank Herbert, like all the greats. And, um, Slaughterhouse Five is kind of his seminal work, but lots of other great stories. Sirens of Titan. Sirens of Titan. Mother, Mother Night. Mother Night. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Cat's Cradle. So many good ones. Yeah. Um, but he has this story. I forget. I read it in one of his memoirs or something. And it, it, he he has an interesting life story. And I think it's part of why he's such a great writer. 
obviously his experiences as a, a, a world a POW, a prisoner of war during World War II in Nazi Germany, will inform you some shit about the truth, right? About the, the truth of, of the human yeah. condition. And you see it talk about yeah. like bi- autobiographical. Slaughterhouse-Five has autobiographical elements for sure because yeah. that character is a POW in Nazi Germany, right? Yeah. But he tells this story anyways, Vonnegut, where uh, one of the first jobs I guess he got after, I think it was after the war, um, cause he was doing whatever, you know, to get by after the war, uh, writing here, working there, whatever. Uh, and he, I think he worked, he wrote for sports illustrated or something. Some mag- that sounds right. Yeah. yeah some, mm-hmm. some, some news magazine, like big news magazine. And he, I think it, he said it was his first assignment or his first big assignment or something. And he went to a horse race and they were like, report on the horse race. And the horse race, he wasn't really interested in it. He was like, I just got to make money and I like writing. And the horse race started, they shot the gun, but I think the horses got scared from the gun. So, uh, they like ran away and one jumped over a fence and it, it, there was no race. They, they canceled <laughs> it essentially. And I think he told, he, he realized he's like, Oh, the piece is due tomorrow <laughs> on my boss's desk. I have no piece. What am I going to write about? That's my job. Yeah. And he says he thought about it. He thought about it. He thought about it. He agonized over it. Next day he goes into his boss's office and he, I think he wrote it and he mm-hmm. handed it to him and it was one line and said, the horse jumped over the fucking fence yeah. and then he quit. <laughs> I don't Amazing. know if it's true because you never know with Vonnegut because yeah. that's what he does. He lies. He, he, he makes stuff up <laughs> to tell a, a greater truth. Well, he lies. Oh, yeah, yeah. He lies on one layer of truth. Exactly. But it's my favorite Vonnegut story because I'm like, oh, that's so you. So if you haven't read Vonnegut, read him and you'll be like, yeah, it sounds yeah, like something Vonnegut That's like the story that, that, that I um, said earlier about John Updike saying like, my good sir, like, what do you think I am? You, you think I'm not writing about the truth, mm-hmm. you know, in fiction, yeah. something like that. You, did that conversation happen? I don't know, right? Exactly. I want to I wanna believe it happened. And there's probably a reason why that story is distilled down to that. The idea know? happened. Yeah. That's yeah. what matters, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what a good storyteller does. I mean, I, I'm reminded of somebody like Dave Chappelle right i think he's or any any great comedian i think Mm -hmm. he's i think he's the greatest storyteller of our time really (laughs) because he he'll tell stories as if like you sort of get a sense that this is a culmination of experiences and places he's been to and things he's seen and conversations he's actually had with people but he's exaggerating upon he's like collecting all of those experiences and then exaggerating upon it for effect right and he's gotten way more people probably uh, hearing his short stories than than George Saunders or, or yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know how many well, copies of he, whatever this has well, been sold, but. Uh, Dave Chappelle said he he won that Mark Twain award or whatever last year, I think, uh, for uh, comedy, basically. I don't, I don't know the exact award, but it's a big award. Like, mm-hmm. all the big people get oh. that award. And he said during it that his, he was raised, his mother, I forget the, the name of it, but uh, teaching him about these, uh, basically, storytellers in, in Africa and these tribes. And, like that was their their culture like they right. you would have you would have a storyteller and you i sort of got the sense that like that's how he views himself obviously as a like a, a continuation obviously in a much different way of but deep human of that tradition, tradition of yeah. storytelling but to like teach truths right i think i think i think human beings evolved with story you know this is kind of a um carl jung idea too that like stories when you distill them down you get to that archetype Mm -hmm. thing right yeah that's why you can analyze pinocchio or the lion king yeah and and spend hours being like oh my gosh or even harry potter like yeah you know we've talked about like whether or not jk rowling actually wrote most or some or all of harry potter because if you get into the details, it's like mythologically very aware, mm-hmm. like the structure is very thought, you know. Oh, like, Harry Potter doesn't happen without previous stories. Yeah. Like there's... Everything down to character names have oh, mythological yeah. roots. Uh, none of it. Mm-hmm. None the of basilisk it is, yeah. is an actual mythological creature, right? Yeah. And and or, it ties into psychological or, realities. Fun fact, Ursula K. Le Guin, who I love, she might be my favorite science fiction author. Yeah. Uh, I th- did I tell you this? How she has she well she she passed away a couple of years ago, yeah. um, but she had beef with J.K. Rowling. Oh really? <laughs> yes, because uh, Ursula K. Le Guin has a series called the Earth Sea series, I think, and it's about. I, and I remember I didn't know anything about it. I read her. She wrote part 
like half her writing was sci-fi, half was fantasy. So I was into her sci-fi. And then I said, oh, let me check out some of her fantasy because her sci-fi is so good. And I started reading this, some stories from this Earthsea series and reading it. I'm like, this kid has magic powers and these wizards come and they're like, you're, you know, Uh-oh. you're one of the <laughs> magic people. So we're going to send you to this school and that nobody else can see. And I'm like, this uh, is, this is Harry, Harry Potter. Potter basically. Yeah. This is freaking Harry Potter. And, and then I looked it up and she had beef with JK Rowling. When I say beef, she had beef with the idea that everybody was praising JK Rowling's for being so original and pioneering. And she was like, uh, I had the wizard school first. Uh-huh. Yeah. And like, I think my wizard school might be better. <laughs> I, should, I should read that. I didn't know about that. Ursula K. Le Guin, I mean. From, so I've read her, The Ones Who Walk Away. Yeah. I and th- I'll link you. Did, didn't you do You did a story. podcast on that, right? I did, yeah. Like yeah. you analyzed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll link that. Yeah. Um, because that's a really great short story. It was not quite short enough. Like the one we're about to read sticks. Yeah. Uh, it's, er, it's 390. So the words. one who walks, the ones who walk away from home lost, short story, hands down, not yeah. a flash fiction yes, story. Exactly. It would take sticks, me a, probably fiction. about, I don't know, five minutes to read, maybe even approaching 10. Home loss? Yeah. It would probably take you to really read it. I'm a slow reader. Yeah, People me think too. I'm a fast reader, but I'm a very slow reader. That The home loss story would take me like 10, 15 minutes, probably yeah. at least. Yeah. Yanka's a fast reader. I am, yeah. Well, like, I am when I I'm grading papers. Or, but. <laughs> or it's like Kay Le Guin is, um, Oh, you did? What was the name of that? I don't know it in English. So, something Solitude, like... Uh, I don't know. Turkish. You see, you see, look. The Left Hand of Darkness? It was like a century... I'm going to find it. Actually. Yeah, no, please look it up. It I would be book. really curious to know what... What the Turkish translation of Ursula K. Or just K. Le Guin Turkish like. perceptions, because Ursula K. Le Guin... I mean, she wrote a lot of novels, but... Um, 100 her, Years of Solitude. I don't think I've read that. Yeah. It, is that part of her... Do you know if that's science fiction or fantasy? Wait, never mind. This is Gabriel Garcia Marquez. That is I not Ursula K. Le Guin. Yeah, I got insanely confused. Sorry, everyone. Uh, he, Everyone, I, stop Googling that. It's I mean, wrong. Marquez is also a great writer, <laughs> yeah. but... Uh, I think Wait, from a stylistic think... perspective, uh, I I mean, I love Harry Potter. I loved reading the Harry Potter novels. I think they're very well written. They're very entertaining. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin's a better writer. Oh, oh, for sure. Just in terms of writing. I, yeah. But, it, but, what I was but Harry, to say, like, Harry Potter is storytelling. That's not to take away from it. There's a reason that Yanka and I, like every couple of months, get an urge to want to watch one of the Harry Potter movies. Of course, yeah. It's because it... it it speaks to something in your being that when you watch it, it you kind of realign to something, you know, um, whatever that is. And like the same thing is why you could watch The Lion King or you could like never uh, the psychologist Jordan Peterson analyzes Pinocchio in like a three hour lecture. Yeah. You're like, oh, my God, I or, or you could, <laughs> thought it was just a movie. You could but watch <laughs> The Lion King or you could read Hamlet. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or you could watch Lord of the Rings and watch um, The Ring of Nibelungen. <laughs> same yeah. thing, basically. Well, I mean these stories all come from the same root, right? And like, when you look at mythology, you have like the the tyrannical father, like the, like mm-hmm. the evil king, but you also have the wise king mm-hmm. and you have the tyrannical mother or, you know, the mad, the overbearing mother, the, yep. the one that can't let their kids go. And yep. you have the, the, um, the, the caring, like, yeah. And you see you it, have the bad good of all you these see characters. It not, not just through centuries, through millennia. Yes. You see all this going back, back to, to the Greeks. Even further back into ancient of Mesopotamia course. with like the the original mythology from yeah from um oh gosh what's it called the something Elish um but you have the, these basically the same seven uh, characters where like the you have the 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 father the son right and sorry the the father and the mother and their two possibilities of yeah. good and evil then the son can be Loki or right, right, or right. Uh, Thor, right? Mm-hmm. He can, right? He can be Cain or Abel, right? right? Yeah. And you just see these same concepts and then something like Harry Potter just rides on top of that. On, but like, because it's tied to something deep, people's psychology really connects to it. Yeah, the, it's, it's in there in terms of how they're engaging without them even necessarily knowing, which in part is what makes some of the best exactly. storytelling. Yeah. And and uh, just in terms of evolution, you could imagine that we evolved as like, you know, in our caveman days where there's like all these different homo species, like homo is the genus and then sapiens is the species. Right. But there was homo habilis, homo neanderthals. Right. All. Yeah. What were neanderthals talking about? Well, they were probably mostly grunting, right? We were. Doesn't we, mean that they weren't telling stories, though. Of course. Yeah. But, but very low resolution stories. We were able to generation after generation build on stories and, and make them more complicated mm-hmm. and, and convey more information. 
And I think the concept is something like stories tell you, pass on information at the subconscious level, right? You're not right, even like right. consciously memorizing things. So if you want a kid to understand that, that the woods are dangerous at night, don't leave the house without mom or dad and just don't go into the woods alone. Yeah. Do you tell them that, what I just said? Or do you tell them a scary story by candlelight about the... Do you show them or do you tell them? Exactly. Yep. And that's that core concept. Have you seen The Ballad of Buster Scruggs? Oh, what? Yes. You need to to rewatch it with this idea in mind of core truths of uh, storytelling because you'll watch that movie and every... It's basically... It's the perfect example. It's one of the few movies I've ever seen. I'm sure there are others but at least in recent years where it's a, it's basically a short story book. They give you one story and then it just cuts to another story. Yeah. And it actually has a book where it flips pages and it says, okay, here it starts showing you the writing and then it goes into the story. Right. They, how they're connected is a really cool thing to discuss, but I think that's something that we need to talk about because there's, I think five or six or seven and they each have, I think very distinct points that, are sort of like you say tapping into that kind of subconscious yeah. ether of the realm the yeah yeah of realm, under yeah. and there's one story in particular that i would be really curious what you have feedback on because it's sort of that i won't say which one because i, I want to see if you can figure it out okay where it, it's sort of that idea of like when you're told not to do something like oh don't do that jimmy yeah, yeah. it's like well jimmy's not going to listen if you just tell him not to do it but there's a reason why you're saying you know, he says why, and you just say, just don't. There's a good reason why you're saying that. And if you can't really express that or teach that, it can wind up being tragic. Yeah. And stories um, can convey that with a fiction. Mm -hmm. They can give you the wrong reason why you shouldn't do it. Right, yeah. But if it stops you from doing it, the story was true. And the story did its job. This level, this this type of truth, rather, would be called pragmatic truth, right? Mm. It's truth that keeps you alive. It sure. doesn't mean you're literally making objective claims about like the atoms that make up the universe or something. You're right. you're believing in something that, or um, biologists, evolutionary biologists call this metaphorical truth, right? Mm. So, for example, let's say porcupine spikes um, once in a while get infected and, and can be a problem if you're living in the woods. Mm. They're not poisonous though, but you believe in the story that porcupines are poisonous. Stay the hell away from them. Mm-hmm. That's a metaphorical truth believe right. in it you'll have a better chance of surviving right even though the literal aspect of the story wasn't actually true right should we read so. sticks sure yeah all right go for it so this is 392 words i wonder how long mine is i'm gonna look that up while you read sticks <laughs> all right because you know sticks <laughs> i do know sticks i have i've actually taught it in my in yeah i have taught it in class yeah yeah this would be, this is the exact, like, I love when I can teach a, a piece of music to somebody, uh, to a student, like when a student's working on music oh, yeah, that I happen absolutely. to love, it's yeah. like a different teaching experience yeah. than when you're just like playing, you know, like yeah. lightly row. Bah, 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 bah. You're yeah. like, do it again, but be better. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> but be less <laughs> Be less that. sucky. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this is Sticks by George Saunders. I'll link it in the episode. I, I think like all reading... I like you just said before, Joe. I prefer to read things very slow and let each sentence hit me. Mm-hmm. And I'm by no means a professional narrator, so do yourself a favor and also read it. Yeah. But here we go. Every year, Thanksgiving night, we flocked out behind Dad as he dragged the Santa suit to the road and draped it over a kind of crucifix he'd built out of a metal pole in the yard. Super Bowl week, the pole was dressed in a jersey and Rod's helmet, and Rod had to clear it. Sorry. <laughs> Super Bowl week, the pole was dressed in a jersey and Rod's helmet, and Rod had to clear it with Dad if he wanted to take the helmet off. On the 4th of July, the pole was Uncle Sam. On Veterans Day, a soldier. On Halloween, a ghost. The pole was Dad's only concession to glee. We were allowed a single Crayola from the box at a time. One Christmas Eve, he shrieked at Kimmy for wasting an apple slice. He hovered over us as we poured ketchup, saying, Good enough, good enough, good enough. Birthday parties consisted of cupcakes, no ice cream. The first time I bought, the first time I brought a date over, she said, "What's with your dad in that pole?" And I sat there blinking. We left home, married, had children of our own, found the seeds of meanness blooming within us also. 
Dad began dressing the pole with more complexity and less discernible logic. He draped some kind of fur over it on Groundhog Day and lugged out a floodlight to ensure a shadow. When an, earth, when an earthquake struck Chile, he lay the pole on its side and spray-painted a rift in the earth. Mom died, and he dressed the pole as death and hung from the cross, crossbar photos of Mom as a baby. We'd stop by and find odd talismans from his youth arranged around the base. Army medals, theater tickets, old sweatshirts, tubes of Mom's makeup. One autumn, he painted the, bulb, the pole bright yellow. He covered it with cotton swabs that winter for warmth and provided offspring by hammering in six crossed sticks around the yard. He ran lengths of string between the pole and the sticks and taped to the string letters of apology, admissions of error, pleas for understanding, all written in a frantic hand on index cards. He painted a sign saying love and hung it from the pole and another that said forgive and then he died in the hall with the radio on, and we sold the house to a young couple who yanked out the pole and the sticks and left them by the road on garbage day. I probably should have rehearsed that. <laughs> I think the story says it all. Yeah. So I, I, I where, where should we start? <laughs> well, here's, here's a good question. What is the meaning of that story? Can I actually <laughs> read a quote from, from this article? Or, or, yeah, yeah. So this William Boyd, um, who wrote the short history of the, of the short story, mm -hmm. said, the true fully functioning short story should achieve, should achieve a totality of effect that makes it almost impossible to encapsulate or summarize. Mm. For it is in this area, it seems to me, that the short story and the novel divide, where the effect of reading a good short story is quite different than that of a novel. The great modern short stories possess a quality of mystery and beguiling resonance about them, a complexity of afterthought that cannot be pinned down or analyzed. Bizarrely, in this situation, the whole is undeniably greater than the sum of its parts. Mm. Did you I think it is so hard. Like, how would you yeah. summarize sticks? Do you remember we were at the bar at a Margarita Monday hang? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let me remind you. It was, it was a solid couple months ago. Still. Um, we, we have a Margarita Monday tradition. Um, oh God, it's a tradition. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know what you would call it. <laughs> Dad I think, died. I think what you just did. We, yeah. we kept up Margarita Monday. All right, yeah, that's going right. to be my short story. Yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> that, there's a story, yeah. Um, and, and we were trying to explain to our other friend the, the story sticks. And like, as we started explaining it, we were like, what the hell are we doing? Just read it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, no, you're how, right. can we, how can we possibly summarize a 390 George Saunders, 390 word George Saunders yeah. short story you, by just clumsily talking at Margarita Monday. Do you know what comes to mind? <laughs> um, I'm curious what you'll think of this. Uh, who is it? Harry Chapin, the song Cats in the Cradle. Oh, yeah. That's what it reminds me of. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Well, what, 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 how do the lyrics go? Like, and the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're going home, son, I don't know when. We'll have a good time then. Right. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying, though? Yeah. Yeah, it's this idea of like deferment of uh, real connection and real communication and the consequence of that and the unredeemable consequence of that type of shutting people out. Yeah. So I think that is a very distinct feeling, but that's as close as I think you can come to describing it, maybe. I, I guess I would describe it if I knew someone across from me had read uh, other authors such as um, uh, Re Revolutionary Road. What's the author there? Uh, mm -hmm. Yates, Richard Yates, mm -hmm. um, or Eugene O'Neill, like his mm -hmm. plays. Like if you can, if you felt that kind of sadness of like the 1950s realism yeah. of that, which I, I, I feel like the dad from this story is of that era. Yeah, it's that same wavelength. That sort of yeah. like... I see through reality too much. It seems sad and hopeless, but, but also I'm still so trying a little soci bit. Society is compressing me to fill this role. Yes. Yeah. Like he couldn't, well, I, I, I guess it depends on how you interpret the story, but he, he didn't so you have a sit down chat and say like, forgive me children for being only letting you take one crayon and being an overbearing father. So you want to hear something really fascinating? along the lines of what you just said as well, is that that's my interpretation as well. And I think it's many of our interpretations reading a story like that where, yeah, this poor father, he was never really able to express love and care 
and all these emotions, these healthy, positive emotions that maybe he did feel to some extent, but he never got to really express them. And by the time he tried to, it was too late. Mm -hmm. That's sort of what I intuit from that story. And I think, right, you would say as well. And possibly so late that it was ineffective. Very much Mm -hmm. so. So when I taught this, um, this story, that's also what many people sort of came to in, in terms of their analysis. But I noticed overwhelmingly my Chinese students took the total opposite uh, an analytical approach where they their whole analysis was about how the children didn't respect their father. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's didn't so take weird. time to understand their father, that this poor father was left to die alone because his children didn't, you know, oh, really so take, take, you know. The radio on. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that is so culturally fascinating. Yeah, it really is. Because to some extent, like, that is that's that an is interesting, fascinating. I'm like, that's a really interesting point to think of it mm-hmm. about it that way that, yeah, things are are also a two way street, and because at first when I, I I read that analysis, I was like, uh, I don't know. But the more I thought about it, I was like, well, we all have our own personal responsibility, ultimately, right, in terms of trying to not be constrained by what the world has done to us or not provided us as well. And I, that, that that's sort of what I felt like they are tapping into in a more kind of extreme way. Yeah, but I I, I just thought it was so interesting how distinctive they are in just there was no i I mean pretty across the pretty much across the board there was among them there was that was their interpretation yeah there was no interesting that's very interesting yeah Yeah. Yeah. and i i don't disagree with it i think that's what i'm saying i love the story because i feel that interpretation Mm -hmm. but i also feel that 1950s realism sadness about life generally interpretation Mm -hmm. like the the um i also feel the sadness of like the children were doomed to become like their their dad exactly yeah right like what was the line when it says um let's see um blah 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 oh we left home married had children of our own first off like with this flash fiction it's like just, I, e- even though, like, just in saying we left home, got ma- married, had children of our own, like, it's a simple sentence, right? So, but yeah. I, I understand just the way it's phrased. So, I, I felt a sort of like, yes. huh, like, life is so short when yeah. you see it from this mm-hmm. perspective. So re- reread the first sentence of the story. Every year, Thanksgiving night, we flocked out behind Dad as he dragged the Santa suit to the road and draped it over a kind of crucifix he'd built out of a metal pole in the yard. That sentence has never been written in another story. That's true. (laughs) It hasn't happened, (laughs) as far as I know. And that's a good sign of a good story when the first line, you Mm -hmm. read it and you say, I've never read that. It's Uh also a little awkwardly long, right? But but so is life. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the part of the point, too. That's, so now, that's really important. So this is what gets really interesting in terms of the nexus of the technical and the thematic. What you're seeing here, and you see this, and look at the last line of the story. Would you also say it's awkwardly long? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Do you think that's coincidental, or do you think this guy really knows what he's doing, right? Uh, the last sentence is starting with the, he painted a sign saying love and hung it from the pole, and another that said forgive, and then he died in the hall with the radio on, and we sold the house to a young couple who yanked out the pole and the sticks and left them by the road on garbage day. That's not... That's a mouthful of words. Not <laughs> incidentally done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's bookended with how he opens the story, and every word, you go back to the first line, Look at the specific diction here. We flocked. We didn't follow. We didn't mm-hmm. go. We flocked. Flock is a very specific. I was going to say that. What's the difference? Oh, like I a, a flock of birds, like where the birds just follow the bird in okay. front of it. And, w- see- and what do the birds who are just following do? They grow up and they do the same thing. Yeah. Because they're part of the flock, which he comes to later. Right, right. So he's already setting up that thematic trope. Right. Yeah. It's brilliant. Um, we... We left home, married, had children of yeah. our own, found the seeds of meanness blooming also within because us. Because we're flocking, we're flocking birds, yeah. just just like they are. And this is why what we were saying earlier that you cannot waste a word here in a story this short. Yeah, he could have said we followed dad. Mm-hmm. He did not write that, and he did not write it because the story, like you say, you don't even think about it reading it, but you get the first, you make Something those connections subconsciously. Of, yeah, yeah. Subconscious yes, mind does yeah. That, exactly. Yeah. And when it's made subconsciously, you, when you read it, you more get 
like I either get the feeling of goosebumps sometimes, like I do when I hear music, it's meaningful for a reason I don't understand consciously, right? It's like deeper into my being. Or I find, um, my grandma used to always make this sound too. Like when you would tell her a quote that's really beautiful or something, she would go, hmm. Like a sort of like that stopped me for a second, you know, yeah, like yeah. I, I always find myself making that kind of sound with short stories like this. But it's because of that, those very specific decisions that add up yeah. over the mm-hmm. course of a piece. Yeah. Well, what's so unfair is when you think of it, like there's so much beauty like this in every language. And when you translate mm-hmm. it into some other oh, language, yeah. it sometimes it completely is yeah. gone. Not even sometimes. I think well, it's almost there's all the a time. Short, I have a book in there of short stories by uh, Calvino. Uh, Italio yeah. Calvino, yeah. great writer. And, yeah. and um, <laughs> he actually means it this time. No, I actually do mean it. I love <laughs> Calvino. But he's Italian. And, Weird dude. And the, like, the translations, really cool writer. they still work. Like So <laughs> it's funny you say that because the closest writer I can think of to him uh, along the lines of what you're saying as well is uh, Jorge Luis Borges. And he has a short story about translation. You should read it. It's really interesting. Okay. And it's all about how you can't translate a short story. Just like you said, yeah. you will lose inherent meaning and so in this right. in this short story it's it's a fictional story but it's about this guy who decides he wants to translate um don quixote by cervantes mm-hmm. he wants to translate that story because it's such a mm-hmm. it's such a cool story but he realizes people need to hear it in, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah he's like they need to hear it in my language and he realizes he tries to translate it and it's trash he's like this isn't what cervantes really meant mm-hmm. so he dedicates his life to trying to experience and live in a way that will inspire him to write the translation independently oh, without uh-huh. without using the first text as yes. like a jumping off point, yes. but to huh. recreate it from the other yes. language to yeah. just become cervantes and write don Quixote. how did that work out for him he yeah. winds he winds up <laughs> becoming <laughs> brain dead for him, of course and that's the <laughs> so point that's what i'm saying you should check out borges like probably one of the i mean a lot of people i guess within my weird writing circles know about him but most you know just casual readers that are like who yeah um, like that type of stuff where you're just like this is layers upon layers this is crazy yeah great short story writer closest i got to that yeah. was when i'm reading a russian like novel like mm. with tolstoy or oh, i don't I know love tolstoy. Tolstoy. i know i love him too yeah. and like even the Tolstoy Turkish so version, good. like the shitty translation of like whatever to Turkish, I was reading. I'm like, oh, there must be so much more to this. Like, I love this. You could but tell. You could smell like it. There's like endless. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. You, the yeah, possibilities. You, like, yeah. yeah, you realize you're like, I know this guy is way better in yeah, his actual language. Exactly. And I felt so bad. I'm like, oh yeah. god, like why do I not know? I feel like each culture has has um, a certain flavor too. Like, I mean, I know Chekhov was like like mm. sort of like in the beginning of the 20th century. This sort of. I don't know what the word would be, but like like sparked the the popularity of the short story yeah. as a medium that that I mean, I think I read today in an art in this article that that uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald like made four thousand dollars to publish a short story in a magazine in America, yeah. which times that by twenty to get like the today's value, you right, know. Right, right. And once it became a thing that people wanted, mm-hmm. people wanted to read it, and then they paid for it. You had all these great writers like being like hey this is a medium that i can yep i can learn it's a constraint you mm-hmm. can, it's not a novel yep and i mean especially this right this is, what would the novel of this be i i, I bet oh. it would be pretty good yeah but it, it would it, be so different it looks so different yeah mm-hmm. what this does is it it says you know it, something the something is more true the, the simpler and more structurally like zoomed out it is, right? Yeah, that's why I love flash fiction though. Yeah. Because you can really, it's it's like a picture almost. Yeah. This is on one page, mm-hmm. right? You you can almost like just look at it and say, oh, that made me feel something or think something differently, right? And I it, it would take us an hour to, to pick apart every single detail to figure out what truths are we learning in here? And yeah. sometimes that's fun. Do you ever wonder or worry that analyzing something like this too much like getting under the hood and figuring out how it works takes away the magic? Uh, That's a really good question. I don't know. I, I mean, I would say just with what we've said so far about it, not mm. really. But, I mean, you actually, the way you talked about the opening sentence and the flocked, I was like, oh shit, there's yeah. more magic here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's cool. I think it's just like learning the, the magic tools. It's like- It would be like us pointing out a chord in Mahler and being like, do you want to know why this gave you yeah. goosebumps? Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. So, so I, I, I don't think of it that I, 
I, I see the inclination to feel that way because it, I think you're right. The effect of it does feel magical. Like it does. In the moment, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what you ideally want. But yeah, from my perspective and, and as somebody who does write, um, I love analyzing especially this type of stuff that's shorter form because like I said, you you, I mean, I call it micro and macro, mm-hmm. right? So you have the micro, which is looking at a sentence and each word in a sentence and how, well, why would you use that word over another? I, I talk about this in academic writing too, but like you have to consider all of that in context of the macro. What is the larger goal, the larger tone, the larger point, the larger purpose? And sort of what we were saying, look at that first sentence. Oh, it has specific word choice. That's usually a good thing on a micro level. But like we said, that connects to other points he's trying to make on the macro level, on the larger mm-hmm. scale, right? So you always have to be sort of consoling that nexus of the micro with the macro. Not not easy to do, but micro he's doing Micro serving macro. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because like you could use a hundred other words than flocked. Like that's mm-hmm. a, you could use a hundred other specific words is what I'm trying to say. But he used that because it's towards that other larger thematic point that yeah. he's trying to build towards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not easy to do because you have to know what that larger thematic point that you're trying to build towards is. And a lot of amateur writers don't know that or have an instinct towards it. Like even if yeah, I mean it's tough. Well, it's not easy. Because if the truth were something he could just write in one sentence, he could just write it. Yeah, mm-hmm. but and then post it on Twitter. We all, it's over. Exactly, two hundred and forty characters yeah. or whatever they give <laughs> yeah. you, right? Yeah, everybody does that one time out of hundred. Mm-hmm. You know. But as we already said, through narrative and 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 story, you can deliver deeper truths than if you just literally said the specific direction. Yeah. And, and right? that's that's what you see here. It's not good yeah. to be an overbearing father. You should find joy in, like, like yeah. I'm bored, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> You're like, thanks, bro. Yeah. I knew funny. that. Yeah. Um, right. it, it's, he's using limited words, yet he says, um, he, ho- he hovered over us as we poured ketchup, saying, good enough, good enough, good enough. He said what's, the same phrase three times. What's the other way? He stood over us. No, he hovered. He hovered. That's what dads do. They hover. Mm-hmm. They hover. And they're and not they're hovering like, for all these good reasons. And they hover. You, you know that. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 Most you of the time, that. it's like, who touched the thermostat? Yeah. Who left you the lights money on? money out the window. <laughs> who left the lights on downstairs? Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. See, but these are all experiences that he's making you tap into, and you're not even realizing it by just one word here or there. Yeah. That's really good writing. The thing that hit me most when I first read it was how abrupt he transitions to different parts of the story, which is very Vonnegut. Yes. Vonnegut will skip ahead and say, yeah, keep up (laughs) like in a way that says keep up. But it also says, I'm telling you what's important in this story. He, he puts you on a ride. Yeah. He's like, you're in this, you're in the seat. You're, you're on my ride. Buttercup. Yeah. Yeah. Buckle (laughs) up. We're, we're going wherever I take you and it's going to do loop de loops. It's going to go in spirals. Because he didn't write. But you trust him. You kids. trust Vonnegut. Yeah, yeah. You read him, and for some reason, you trust Saunders. Like, I have you. You lent me um, the Saunders book of short stories. I've, it's called something Nation. Um, oh, uh, uh, per, uh, in Persuasion Nation. In Persuasion Nation. Yeah, fantastic short story collection. Um, Highly recommend. Those it. are mostly like ten pages to twenty pages long. Something. Did like you that. read the one at the end with the the Coca Cola characters and stuff? I don't think I got to that one. I you read should one really in the read middle. it. Oh, read the one. Read the last one in that okay. collection. You're going to be like, oh boy, this is yeah, this is wild. It's um, gosh, I mean, he, he didn't say they they graduated high school and went to college. We left home, married. Well, there's 15 years. Yep. <laughs> Why'd you skip yeah. everything else in between? Had children of our own. Found the seeds of meanness. Like had had children of our own. Didn't have his g- grandchildren. Yeah. Had children mm-hmm. of our own. Right, it's this idea of like they're ours now. We're separate from you. Yeah, yeah. Very specific, sure. and again, you have to really think about that specific phrasing, right? Yeah. When an earthquake struck Chile, he lay the pole on its side and spray painted a rift in the earth. Mom died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not like m- mom got cancer and slowly just mom died, and it's like yeah. it's the it's almost like he's capturing the sadness of when you zoom out on life. Mm-hmm. A mom dying happens every fucking day, you know? Every few seconds, probably. Probably second. in, in the span of me finishing this sentence, many moms have died, right? Yeah, also life overall is generally so short that that's how, like, when you look at it, probably once you're in your deathbed, that's, like, 
the events that you remember that's the order of things like you don't remember the buffer events mm. like these the are buffer just, events aren't that's, important that's, that's, remember the yeah. checkpoints so it's a question of what you choose to assign meaning to as well yeah mm. yeah certainly like when you're zooming out like because i this is the kids telling the story every year yes. thanksgiving they night, are the narrator yeah. out. right it's it's that's yeah. a, that's an interesting choice too the narrator isn't one of the children yeah it it is one of the children, but it's also the children, right? It's the yeah. the idea of the children. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I love this story. It's so it good. It is really good. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much here to unpack. I'm like, one... I mean, we're not going to unpack all of it. I just no, wanted to should... kind of uh, yeah. gift this to you, the listener, so yeah. that you can like. Um, we should have started time with, with my story. Yeah, shit. Now yeah, we're what? gonna read your story. Yeah, <laughs> because I'm realizing as Sorry, we're talking Joe. about this, I'm like, my story is basically like sticks, like B list. Yeah, you know, <laughs> fine. I'm like, should. Would it would it make you feel better if uh, we hit pause and I try to write sticks like Z list? <laughs> uh, it might make somebody feel better, I suppose. <laughs> the last thing I want to point out in this one, then we'll read your story real quick. Is um, we we talked about this before too. The way the 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 wording of and then he died in the hall with the radio on and we sold the house to a young couple. Blah blah blah. Mm. The, the the fact that he said with the radio on somehow magically makes me when i read that story i pictured i pictured the hallway in the house i grew up in that's what he wants yeah that but it's i that's all i have to say <laughs> like, I, I picture a hallway like a long hallway with a lot of rooms branching off from it and he's just somewhere along that timeline of the hallway yeah, and not, there's not even radio. Like in the chair. No, no, no. Yeah, if he's between hall, he's between rooms or something. Like just lost. I in kind of picture almost time. like a movie scene where, when when somebody dies at home alone, there's like an and there's something like a TV on or a radio on. There's a sad element of like, well, first off, no one's there that can help them. Mm-hmm. If they just fall in the hallway, it's not even like they died in bed where you might say you're supposed to die or something. Mm-hmm. And then the radio or the TV just keeps going. It's like time's just like tick, tock, tick, tock, yeah. on and on it goes. And you're not a part of it anymore. Mm-hmm. Or certainly your body is, right? But but whatever you, you, the essence of you was sure, yeah. no longer is. It just, when he writes with the radio on, for some reason it makes the dad dying like, mm-hmm. oh, like I, I felt it more than with it, without it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's one of those finer details that's so subtle and... I think that detail, it's interesting you mentioned because that might be more than any of them where all the others, like we said, like the specific word choice, I, I could see myself coming up with. But that thematic detail, I'm like, damn, that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think I would have ever come up with <laughs> like that, yeah. That's really clever. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and, and was it intuition? Was it um, the yeah. craft of writing? Obviously, it was probably both, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, I highly recommend... Um, clicking like there's free pdfs of this story oh, everywhere yeah. on the internet I'll that's link. the great thing about flash yeah. fiction it's so short they're like we're not going to try yeah. to well, how, how could we try to in, yeah you know, <laughs> it's, it's like an eight second song put it in like, like nine tweets like yeah. it's fine <laughs> you know um i highly recommend reading it and sitting with it because it's like these these subtle details come out like on your 10th yeah. time reading it or i'm sure you've read it probably hundreds of times well yeah because i because you taught, I taught it, it. Yeah, yeah yeah and it's still every time i'm like i'm even just talking about it, i was like actually that makes more sense now. Yeah. You know, that we, that we talk about. And that's the true sign of a great story. Not a good story, a great story. Yeah. Where whenever you read it again, you get more out of it. And um, Jordan Peterson, when I've listened to the, like the psychological significance of the Bible lectures, he'll, he'll say the same thing. Like these are stories that took thousands of years to distill down to like single sentences that are like, mm. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like a thousand years of human beings trying how to live life and then encoding the information on how to live the pragmatic truth yeah. into one sentence. Like Cain and Abel is one right. paragraph long. It's so and short. And it tells you how to not be a resentful piece of shit in life. Yeah. <laughs> it's but, a great story. <laughs> and it's a really good story. Yeah. And it's it's the basis of so many other stories that... Romulus and Remy's. Or uh, Loki and, and, and it's, Thor. It's Thor. these <laughs> archetypes. Yeah. yeah. Right. You want to read yours now that we've uh, talked about the Bible and George Saunders? <laughs> yeah, yeah, not to not to set you up for utter failure or anything. Well, at least um, you get to read it. If you guys want to look it up um, to read along, I'll I'll read it. I can pull it up on yeah. here. Yeah, on you, the iPad. It's yeah. called uh, the the title is Coloring In, okay. and you can just type in Coloring In by Joe Labriola, and it will probably come up in Google. 
um, as like the first result. Uh, but yeah, you know, interestingly enough, when I, um, cause I wasn't getting it on the webpage, so I don't know, mm -hmm. hopefully you have. A I got time. it already. Okay. Wait, why, why is mine not loading? Yeah. Mine wasn't loading. I don't know why. Oh, on the garrowstation.com? Yeah. yeah. Ooh, yeah. Safari cannot load the page. The server cannot be found. I think whoever you published this with uh, went out of business in COVID. No, yeah. the, website's, the website's definitely still there. Um, can I share it with you on Google Docs? Yeah. yeah. yeah sure. Okay, I'll, I'll just share it with you on Google Docs quick. Uh, All right, we're back. We're we have now solved our technical issues. And Joe is now going to follow up the Bible and George Saunders with his story <laughs> yeah. coloring in. I, I don't know if that, well, yeah, okay. That's... It is a, about the same length as a stick. So it's funny yeah. you say that. I didn't, I didn't even realize, and I, I said that I think there's a strong connection here to sticks. But uh, w when I did submit it, it says a, around 400 words. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. It's in the tradition of, of that flash fiction. Flash fiction, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So here it is. Uh, the title is Coloring In by Joe Labriola. Dad led the confused procession to the minivan. Come on, come on, he said, swinging open the door and waving us forward. Let's go. We bounced up into our seats, eyes glued to our handheld games as he buckled us in without another word. The family fall hike had never seemed that special. Just another random weekend event embedded in the typical chaos of our autumn school schedule. To us, it was just another ordered day in a continual string of adult planned days. Christmas and Easter, baptisms and birthdays, all alike. Sissy, sit next, Sissy sat next to me, arms crossed after her iPad battery went kaput. It's not even fall yet, she complained, staring at mom's seat back as we crawled along with the weekend traffic, all headed in the same direction. We go every year, this, uh, I'm sorry, we go every time this year, mom said, turning on the overhead TV. Dad coughed and spat out the window. The park was different from how I remembered it the year before. Where are all the leaves, I asked as we walked along a pressed dirt path among the tall trees. Mom's eyes narrowed. They're everywhere. I glanced up at the green canopy as it hissed in the warm breeze. But they're all green. Where are the brown ones and the yellow? Where are all the colors? Dad heaved a grunt from the head of our pack. They're coming, he answered between labored breaths. They always change. I was shocked. For the rest of the walk, I expected at any moment to blink open my eyes to the sight of red leaves falling down like paper snowflakes, but they never did change, not even the slightest shade. We went the rest of the way in silence, eventually looping back around to the gravel parking lot. Let's go, Dad said, ushering us back to the minivan. Why didn't they change, I asked as we hopped back in. Dad's face twitched into a half frown. You'll have to explain this too someday, he answered and slammed the door. That didn't make much sense. But by the next family fall hike, all I could tell was that the leaves change later every year. Mm, that's nice. You definitely captured the same dad vibe as sticks. Of, I think it's yeah, a very similar dad vibe. It right? is. Of that sort of, um, you'll have to explain this too. It's like, but dad, you didn't explain it. <laughs> you didn't answer anything, <laughs> yeah. as a matter of fact. I and love the lost sentence. Nice. It's just, I, I mean, it needs, I need some time to process, yeah. like, well, I'm, I'm, curi but... I'm curious what, what you think in terms of... Can I tell you what I think, like the first impression? Yeah. Like, it's more of a funny one. Yeah. I picture uh, the story you've told me of you going on vacation to Disney World <laughs> with your family when you I lived in this... Florida. Yeah. And you guys were fighting in the backseat of the car and your dad's like, that's it. We're not going to Disney World. Canceled. You know, like yeah. <laughs> I yep. picture like the... the um, there's a very specific vibe of like, a family who's on the brink of screaming at each other yeah. going on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> it's like every yep. family pretty much. Well, it's relatable in that sense, right? I mean, there's definitely some like, oh, I'm, I don't know how to put it into fancy words. So it's going to sound really shallow. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the time to not use fancy words. Okay. Like my job is to use the fancy words. Your job is yeah. to say what you think. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. The last sentence really resembles like can you reread aging. the last sentence that didn't make much sense and uh, i'll read the last yeah sure couple dad's face dad's face twitched into a half frown you'll have to explain this too someday he answered and slammed the door that didn't make much sense by the next family fall hike all i could tell was that the leaves change later every year so there's something about also time not just on the cycle of the seasons but on the grander scale of like 
climate change makes yes the leaves yeah. change later every yes. year. Mm-hmm. You're one of the only people who have noticed that, <laughs> and that's actually what the motivation sort of well was in part with this larger sort of theme was the fact that this father and this family are going through these routines. They're going through these traditions. They're not really sure why they're not really interested in each other. They're not really interested in the traditions, Mm -hmm. but they're going through them. They're sitting in traffic. They're contributing to the problem clearly. And Mm -hmm. every year it's just that tradition erodes because you're ruining the world around you through that lack of awareness of what the meaning <laughs> behind this actual tradition is. So it's kind of like a, a negative feedback loop almost. Yeah. Yeah. And it manifests very tangibly in the form of climate change where every year the leaves get later and it just makes, it exposes the sort of um, artifice of like, oh, we're doing this because we have to do a family trip. And it's like, but we're doing a family trip to do this and it's not real. Yeah. There are no leaves. So why are we doing it? And then it just, and he's like, well, you have to explain it too. Whereas opposed to his father might've been like, oh yeah, the leaves are cool. Right. And the kid's like, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then now he's the father and he's like, the leaves are cool. Right. And it's like, no, they're still green. What are you talking Mm -hmm. about? Also, he's half thinking we better get back in that minivan and beat the traffic. Also that. Yeah. Because that's what dads do. That's what dads do. Yeah. <laughs> They're always like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's, we got to leave. Yeah. yeah. Enough, enough, enough. Yeah, like, yeah. Like in sticks, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Good enough. Mm-hmm. Good enough. Yeah, good good enough. enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. Just, I mean, there's no awareness going on on their part. They're like, oh, like I did the family trip thing. Like I yeah. did my share. Like I adult, like, you know, became like I parented to my kids, whatever, mm-hmm. but they didn't mm-hmm. even like take it into consideration. I like but, also how you, you, it, it, for me, I read the beginning, the opening, as if it's very early in the morning. Dad yeah. led the confused procession to the minivan. Yeah. I have very many memories of us going on a family vacation and leaving at like four in the morning. <laughs> and like yeah. my dad would just like wake us up in bed and be yep. like, we're doing it. And I'm like, oh my God. Well. And you, yeah. you, as a kid, when you are woken up in the middle of your sleep, you're just like, yep. <laughs> What's happening? And, and, and then you see the world and it's like the sun's not up. There's no cars yeah. on the road. You're mm-hmm. like, is this what it's like out here when I'm at home and safe in my bed? It's like- supposed to be asleep. It's so funny you say that because that's, and again, it's similar to the word choice that we talked about in sticks where saying confused procession, again, a procession is kind of a formal thing. Confusion similar is- Similar to flock, yeah. Exactly. And I wasn't willing to say, oh, we were confused and early from, uh, uh, confused and tired from how dad woke us up so early. That's the telling version of that. What you you just identified where we were a confused procession is you tap into that understanding where you're like, oh, yeah, I've been there. And I think the same thing I was thinking of when we were kids. And I remember eating too much White Castle the night, <laughs> the night, the night before we had to catch a 5 a.m. flight to Florida. Right. You know, and it was the same thing. Where, like you're shaking out a bed full of sodium and not enough water. And yeah, like, yeah. And then you gotta get in the car at the airport. <laughs> And we're like, okay, I guess like everybody gets worse line. than a hangover. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. White Castle hangover. Yeah. So it's that same uh, sort of, yeah, exactly. That that same sort of uh, very specific choice. That's that's nice. description. Yeah, and I really mom was doesn't able to get envision it. that. Seriously. Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's so sort nice. of it's one of those yeah. universal things where people are like, yeah. I kind of get that. I you know, we go every time this year. Mom said, like. Mom's like, I can't tell you what's wrong. Yeah, right? what I was trying to say earlier was they yeah. don't care like if the leaves are whatever or not. They're like, right. this is family time. She's like, did this I pack sandwiches? Like, did I whatever. remember to pack exactly. enough food? They're mm-hmm. like, zo- did I bring the Advil in case one of the kids gets a headache? Like, right. they're distracted with so many details. Whereas the kid just like looking out the window, like, I remember this trip last year. The leaves were really like red and orange and cool. That's all I remember from yeah. last year. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because the rest of it's a nightmare. <laughs> uh. We go every time this year, Mom said, turning on the overhead TV. Dad coughed and spat out the window. It was really nice. So it, it's very sticksy, right? <laughs> it's very sticksy in that, like, but that's that's flash fiction. You have to. Do but that. it's also how human memory works. We we remember exactly very weird, specific details. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I mean, of course, it depends on like memories. Like, if you go, okay, I think we all have a memory of nine eleven. Like, what we were doing that day because it was like a major event or something. But even just like. Yanka and I will have, we'll get in, um, what's the, what's the word? We'll get in like reminiscent moods sometimes where, where, where like, she'll be like, tell me a story from your childhood or something like, and I'll just try to conjure up one. And then it's amazing how much detail is still there, Mm -hmm. but it's funny which ones are there and which ones aren't. Almost always 
none of the dialogue is left. Right. And and it's imagery. This, this dialogue and, is very sparse for that reason, yeah. right? And in fact, what you pointed out about the TV, that's another, again, tr me trying to tie into this idea of deferment of, like Sticks tries to show, deferment of connection or meaning. Well, the, uh, the, the my sister's iPad goes kaput. Yeah. It's just dead. So mom's like, I don't want to have to deal with this. I'll turn on the overhead TV. There's another technological deferment of actually engaging your children and actually communicating with them. Right. So you go to the backup now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's always another layer where you can sort of defer that. that dad dad meaning. is rarely speaking. He's grunting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, when dads are just like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and also, uh, uh, I, I don't know if I'll, oh, yeah. Um, they're coming, he answered between labored breaths. I remember always growing up seeing my dad, like he was a little overweight and like labored and breathing and like, there's always this fear like dad's going to collapse at any time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like that's part of this whole thing too. It's like yeah. the parents aren't wise enough or uh, powerful enough to change why the leaves aren't changing. And this <laughs> is, but this is... It's happening. Something bigger. Yes. Winter is coming. And, and this is too... The, so my... Winter's not coming. Well, well it, no, it is. It's the opposite. Winter is not coming. Global that's, warming winter is coming. That's a problem. Coming, yeah. But it, it's... So my intention is exactly what you were... I think you're saying is... Uh, sort of reflecting to um, how like the father or the parents who should be in the know are ignoring this reality of the world crumbling around them. Mm -hmm. The children are noticing these parents are crumbling, but they don't have the tools to really understand how to fix it or why. And neither do the parents. And yeah. that's a problem. And your grasp on it is the leaves are something's different right. and nobody knows the reason. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they said they would change, but it's the end of the hike and they haven't changed. Aren't they mm -hmm. supposed to? I yeah. thought it's just time. Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. no, there is no time, you dummy. Yeah. <laughs> You're just like spewing fossil fuels, like unfettered yeah. into the mm -hmm. atmosphere. Taking like, your stupid vacation that none of you enjoyed. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is, did you use Sticks as a sort of like um, inspiration oh, for this? Oh, I, I mean, Sticks is one of my favorite stories of all so time. So you couldn't help but use it as it, yeah. And, and as you should. Mm -hmm. I remember when we had to, in, in undergrad, we had to compose like a um, a piece of music that was supposed to mimic like a sonata or something. And I and I wrote it for trumpet and piano. Mm -hmm. And I used the Hindemith trumpet sonata as a sort of like jumping off point. Because mm -hmm. I was like, the idea of just jumping into this project with nothing as yeah. a guide yeah. was too too much. But I thought, okay, like I'm gonna do that kind of like, I'm in a key, it's like tonal, but I can use all these different harmonic, like I'm not using standard functional harmony, I'm, I'm using 20th century mm -hmm. ideas of what it means to quote unquote, have a tonal center, but not with functional harmony. And it came out decent. Like uh, I remember that the teacher like kind of liked it. I'm like, I kind of just, copied <laughs> into myth and made yeah. it my own because <laughs> yeah. I'm not a composer. Did I pass? Yeah. yeah. I think Literally. I played it. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, well, I think I have one more quote. If I remember, I saved it in, um, somewhere. Ah, yes. So um, just to sort of bookend, like what I love about short stories, Virginia Woolf said of photography, quote, isn't it odd how much more one sees in a photograph than in real life? And then this guy, William Boyd, ended his um, article on short stories saying, this gives us, I think, a clue to the enduring power and appeal of the short story. They are snapshots of the human condition and of human nature. And when they work well and work on us, we are given the rare chance to see them in more, to see in them more than in real life. Mm -hmm. Because if you just like take any event that you're just hanging out at, your mind is half wandering internally yeah. not noticing the details or if you are it's not at that conscious level mm -hmm. like it gives you a sort of glimpse that that it gives you a glimpse into your vacation that yeah. i wouldn't get if i was sitting in that minivan if i was like your family therapist like right. observing you all but, it, but it's but it still reflects like i mean you guys identify where you're like oh yeah i know that vibe yeah mm -hmm. yeah and she comes from a completely different culture, but she knows exactly the vibe of like, we got to get up early, get in the car and get to where we're going. I remember doing that with her family when I was in Turkey. We yeah. had to go to Eski Shehir. It's like a three hour drive from Istanbul. Yeah. And I remember like getting into the car at like four, 5 a.m., something like that. Everybody's like pissed at each other. Everybody's like, just like yeah. subtly like, yeah. just like trying not to flip out on each <laughs> other. <you know? laughs> yeah. I'm about and, to freak out, man. Yeah. 
but anything I, could happen. But, you know? I, but I think that is the value of pretty much everything. I It's funny because I feel that same way about all the crazy beach clean stuff I do now, which ironically... Like Episode it, five, I'll link that too. It's worth mentioning because I really don't have time to write much fiction anymore. I love writing fiction and I, I've, I feel like I write decent fiction, but um, I've sort of transitioned into this beach clean work because it's that sort of ethos of what I'm trying to capture in something like that, that story coloring in where it's like, we need to really start to think about why are we really doing what we're doing and consuming what we're doing and sort of attaching value to what we're doing. I I made a a YouTube video, actually, I think it was a couple of weeks ago now where uh, basically what I do now for a lot of the videos is I go out and I say like, okay, I'm going to try to just find balloons today or find cans. Find one specific. Yeah. Find, you know, uh, face masks or or something. And I did that with balloons and it was the same thing where I found, I think 20 something balloons in a day. And just talking to people on YouTube and Reddit and getting more insight and having really interesting conversations with total strangers about, yeah, you know, I, I know I've used balloons in the past for my mom's memorial because I had nothing left. Yeah. And like, I needed a, a meaning and I'm like, but this is causing that. And he was like, yeah, like I understand, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like really asking, well, you know, how do we almost putting a, and so it goes line yeah. as well, your answer. Well, and because these these things are causing actual problems and it's like we we need to really like talk more and, and communicate better and, and try to re- reassess again how we attach value to, to different things. And um, I, I think, again, it's really interesting how different uh, types of creative expression like that. It, it's it's kind of once more trying to tap into those uh, those same inherent truths. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, if I if I may put your story and sticks in the same sentence, they both also capture a sort of helplessness about life, which is mm. it's it's going forward in a way you can't control. To to an extent, the leaves are going to change yeah. later, and maybe that maybe human beings are not smart enough collectively to figure that out. Yeah. That, but we, that we climate change thing. We need to at least try. Yeah, and that's sort of my point with with my fix. Uh, well, if you're not trying, yeah then that's just nihilism, right? Well, that that's what's interesting is that my the beach clean work I do is an extension of the fiction I've written where I'm like, this is important work to try to at least try to do something, right? And I think you're right. The alternative is nihilism, just eh. And yeah. I've gone down that nihilism road just mentally and sometimes even literally in my life, like for a week or two at a time. And I'm just like, very quickly I realize, however true this is, it doesn't it doesn't lead anywhere nice. Well, I think it's it's an interesting path to explore mentally. I think you definitely want to explore it mentally. Yeah. And and I feel the same way where I, I feel like it's actually important to explore. And I have. And I people who I've been in discussions with people where they argue that path. And I'm like, all I can do is show you why I think this is maybe a better way for these reasons, not to even say that it's, it's better because what is better? Well, the nihilist right? has something really strong on, on their, I think it's on a their very, side, which it's is a very strong argument. Very, yeah. very truthful. And yeah. if, yeah, it's if, very honest, if you don't, yeah. if you don't give them their due of what they're yeah. saying is true, then yeah, I, I don't ultimately agree with it, but I think it's very, they're almost, again, it's very right, honest. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel. But then it, yeah. the argument for us would be perhaps it takes a leap of faith to, to not be nihilist. And, and what is being human other than leaps of faith? Yes. Let's right. end it there. That's a good place to end mm-hmm. it. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Any last thoughts, Yanka? Well, then you have to end the podcast. Bye. All right. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Joe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sounds great. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Exploring Kodawari. If you enjoyed it, we hope you'll consider sharing it on social media and with friends. You can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Those help us more than you would think. And if you'd like to help us out in a more substantial way, consider going over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links are in the episode notes for this. You can do this as a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. All of that support will help us to set aside time in order to create content for the podcast and the blog. And finally, please get in touch with us and say hi, either on social media or privately through email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening and see you next time.